My name is Kelly Brown and I'm the AP US history teacher here in East Hampton and I'm lucky and I was lucky enough to have 25 students in my course this semester. 20 of them will be presenting tonight. Uh, five of them were seniors and they got out of doing this project so I'm sure that they're breathing a, a sigh of relief at this moment but most of them are in the audience here to enjoy the program. So the work that my students are doing tonight is incredibly important. They have taken the time to do real historical research tonight and so what they're sharing here tonight is authentic historical research where they had the opportunity to really focus on uh, a local historical topic and really dive into the real work of historians of working with primary sources. They have been working very very hard and uh, they've been an absolutely fabulous class and so I just want to thank all of them in front of you for uh, being so hardworking and for really all the work that you've done this year. You guys are incredibly impressive and uh, I really congratulate you for this work tonight and your work is fabulous and we look forward to seeing your presentations. So if we could just give them a round of applause beforehand, that'd be great. You guys can come right in. So the format for tonight uh, is that each student will present for about five minutes. They're just going to give you a small window into the work that they've done this year. And um, if anyone is interested in more information, you can feel free to contact me. I do have their research papers and more information about the work that they've done. Uh, we're going to start the program before our first presentation by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. And so if Joe Kutuzik could come up here, the flag is right here. He's going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, if everyone could please stand. All right, let's see if I can remember this. Where's the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with unity and justice for all. Our first speaker tonight is Timothy D'Andrea, and he is going to be presenting to you about some strikes that took place here with the West Boylston Company in 1918. Good evening, my name is Tim Dandria, and I'm a junior here at East Hampton High. In our search as a class to find out about local history, our first task as students was to decide what exactly we wanted to learn about. The vast topics that we explored in our AP US History class gave us the base in deciding what, er what eras as well as topics interested us. The time period in which I am most interested in is in the early 20th century, specifically the end of World War I and the years after. The first topic that jumped out at me was Prohibition. As we, began, uh, as we began research, my quest to discover something about how Prohibition affected our local area came up blank. In my search through the Forbes Library resources, I discovered a set of worker strikes that occurred around the same time. The industrial aspect of the topic intrigued me as I knew our local area was established mainly as a mainly industrial area. The abundance of resources at the Forbes, li Forbes Library in Northampton made my decision to switch simple. Okay. The establishment of industry in East Hampton can be attributed to two generations of people. The first generation was led by a man named Samuel Wilson. Wilson moved his button company to East Hampton as the abundance of resources offered a great opportunity for success. Wilson developed the area to suit his needs by doing things like damming Broad Brook to, create, to develop upper and lower Mills Pond. He used the force of the water source as power for his factories. Several years after Wilson's businesses were extinguished, the West Wilson Manufacturing Company moved into Lower Mills Pond. 
The West Boston Company grew to become East Hampton's first million dollar operation and the defining factor for East Hampton's success. Okay. In the year 1918, as the First World War was coming to an end, the West Boston Company experienced a series of two strikes that ironically exemplified the company's compassion for the town that gave them their success. The first strike lasted from April of 1918 to June of that same year. The strike was partially resolved when a government mediator awarded the employees with raises. The lack of total resolution allowed many lingering disputes to be left unsolved. The second strike was a much more violent interaction. The lengthiness of the strike influenced the West Boston employees to seek support from local workers to bring the strike to a higher level. Um, this here is a flyer of how the East Hampton workers were looking to uh, unify with uh, Ludlow, workers, Ludlow textile workers to try to create the National Textile Workers Union so that they can um, fight against the textile industry um, together. The West Boston Company's original strategy was to use the government as a mediator. This strategy mirrored the strategies of companies all over the U.S. Of the time, at the time. The knowledge they gained from the lack of success of this strategy influenced them to take a different approach the second time around. The West Boston Company's involvement in the community allowed them to take a more compassionate approach to the situation. The company developed a series of steps to understand the employee's view but not change their own. The West Boston Company used sensible face-to-face -face discussion to work with the their striking employees. The company worked to compensate on the issues that employees were irritated by. The West Boston Company's use of realistic goals in dealing with the strike allowed them to come out of the strike better than before. Compassion for one another is something people cherish in relationships. But for some reason, when businesses are involved, that cherished quality is lost. The West Boston Company's exemplary use of compassion in an industrial disagreement shows a realistic application in the situation when businesses are involved. If all money and stature was thrown out, the real-life employee-employer relationships are no different than a simple brother-to-sister relationship. You may fight, but you understand where each other are coming from, and you have to live with it. It just takes one person to think like this and apply it to prevent these simple dis disagreements from growing into national catastrophes. And I wanted to thank Ms. Feely, the local history goddess, for all her help. And then I also want to thank Ms. Perry of the East Hampton Historical Society, because she helped me finding a lot of, find a lot of primary documents. And then Ms. Brown for all help throughout the semester <coughs> to develop my writing skills. And it helped a lot, because this was my first research paper. Ever. So we're Good evening. My name is Haley Hill and I just completed my sophomore year here at EHS. My topic is the flood of 1936, its impact on western Massachusetts, and how communities coped with its effects during the Great Depression. I picked this topic because natural disasters along with the Great Depression have always fascinated me. It was only natural that I would pick something that would combine those two elements. As I delved into researching my topic, the tornado that shocked our area hit. Natural disasters always have an element of surprise to them, but this one, is, this one was especially outrageous due to the fact that we haven't had a major devastation since the flood of 1936, which crippled our area 80 years ago. It is not often that anything brutally affects the unsuspecting citizens of western Massachusetts. Severe weather often does not reach the extent of its powers due to the fact that the region is shielded by Mount Tom. However, every now and then a powerful storm or blizzard will unleash its wrath on the seemingly sheltered citizens of the area, leaving catastrophic results in its wake. Both the flood of 1936 and the recent tornado are prime examples of this. The image shown at the bottom of the slide is one from an issue of the Gazette in 1936, which depicts the Grim Reaper in the midst of the flood washing out towns. The Grim Reaper was often used in flood cartoons and newspapers to represent devastations from the flood and the daunting effect it had on people's lives. The question that I wanted to research was as follows. To what extent did the disastrous effects of the flood of 1936 harm towns and residents of western Massachusetts, and how did communities aid already poverty-stricken citizens who were affected by the flood? 
In order to prepare my conclusion, I was able to look through four giant scrapbooks filled to the brim with newspaper clippings from 1936 that had to do with the flood. It was interesting to see the Gazette and other local newspapers focusing so heavily on the subject. After much research through those and other sources, I was able to prepare my own original thesis, that being, while people tried to cope with the economic and social strains of the time period, the flood of 1936 shocked the towns of western Massachusetts with its devastations. As unsuspecting citizens faced the perils that the flood imposed on their homes and lives, communities banded together to help and support affected inhabitants, despite the fact that there was a depression happening at the time. The flood in turn magnified the neighborly actions taken by communities during the time of hardship. Dealing with the effects of the Great Depression in general was, general was difficult, but was made easier through the actions of neighbors. Neighbors assisted each other through sickness, childbirth, and change. When a member of a neighbor's family died, it was actually expected that one would help to dig a grave and bury the dead so as to relieve grief from the adjacent family. Dinners and possessions were shared at ease. All holidays were celebrated with one another. It was even said that people were almost foolish in the way they trusted and helped their neighbors. When the flood of 1936 hit, the devastation it left in its wake annihilated towns in western Massachusetts who were already struggling with the Great Depression. The picture shown is a picture of a railroad that was upturned by the flood itself. Bridges were swept away, communication was cut off, roads and highways were torn out, and houses, factories, and businesses were trashed. Animals and people alike drowned. Damages to all affected cities and towns estimated at $500 million at the 1936 standard, back when you could purchase a simple cup of coffee for 10 cents. Affected cities included Northfield, Greenfield, Deerfield, South Deerfield, Sunderland, Hatfield, Northampton, East Hampton, South Hadley, Hoyle, Willamancet, Chicopee Falls, Indian Orchard, Chicopee, Westfield, West Springfield, Southwick, Longmeadow, Agawam, Hadley, Amherst, and Springfield. Looters pillaged people's houses and other buildings in search of goods whilst people were being evacuated. Today, the same thing is happening with the aftermath of the tornado. However, after the flood of 1936, looting became such a large issue that citizens could not stop the thieves on their own, and the National Guard troops were brought in to restore order in the cities. They were actually given shoot-on-sight orders in order to thwart further looting. Imagine today's looters being shot at instead of simply being arrested. Since devastation was so widespread and extreme, the relief process took months. The picture shown depicts neighbors helping each other shovel the mass amount of mud leading up to a house. Neighbors were there for each other just as they had been throughout the rest of the Great Depression. The Red Cross, local hospitals, local clubs, local students, legions, and other volunteers were also people who contributed to relief efforts. The gymnasiums and schools were used for kids to stay at and be entertained by supervised sports, games, and shows, and other salvageable buildings were used as additional shelters. Free magic shows, comedies, and plays were put on for struggling families to try to lighten their load. Federal aid granted by President Roosevelt was also beneficial, as was the work by the Works Progress Administration and Civilian Corp Conservation Corps, two groups created during the New Deal that helped clean up and rebuild. Communities truly banded together as they never had before, all in the name of aiding their inhabitants and in easing the post-flood pain and loss that so many people were forced to deal with. I would like to thank Mrs. Feely for her time, help, and resources that she provided for me and the rest of the class. I would also like to thank Ms. Brown for helping me with not only this project, but many more that I had throughout the year, as well as for everything she's done for the class. We really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the presentations. Hi, I'm Liz Berdeau. Um, I'm a past junior incoming senior pick, and I don't generally like podiums, so I'm going to try walking it around and make it difficult for the camera guys. Um, I did my project on the Walter Scott Memorial Tower up on Anniversary Hill. Um, so once upon a time, I was over at my friend's house, who lives in Holyoke, and he was like, let's go for a walk. Like, okay, you like to take three hour walks, let's see how this is going to go. So we went for a walk, and he took me up towards Jarvis Ave off Northampton Street, and we wound up, where did it go? <laughs> Here. 
Um, does anyone kind of sort of know what they're looking at? Looks kind of like a, an ant farm, doesn't it? Well, we went through here all the way over and around and wound up right there, which is this. Does anyone know now what they're looking at? I didn't either at first. I had no idea. I thought it was a cool looking tower. It looked kind of old and a lot of graffiti. And when I first saw it, it wasn't one of those, oh my goodness, this is a historical piece of information. This has a lot of significance to me. It was, oh no, there's a lot of broken glass. I should probably put my shoes on. Um, I, it was difficult to figure out what I was looking at because the pool that was once at um, Community Field in front of Scott's Tower wasn't there anymore. And the playground that I remember playing on when I was a kid wasn't there anymore. So, and I, I remember tying my shoes on that rock, not knowing that if I had just turned around, it would have said Scott's Tower on the other side. I completely missed everything. Um, and so I pretty much used this project as an excuse to learn about the tower and figure out what was going on. And as I started doing research, I found that not a lot of people really knew that it was around, what it was used for, which kind of made it difficult until I went to the Holyoke History Room at HCC, and um, Jim, the curator there, threw a folder at me. I got a lot of information. I got, I got a lot. It was a lot to sift through. I couldn't even sift through it all. I had to take pictures of some of it and go home and then sift through it. It was, it was a lot of different stuff. And as I went through all this and, and a lot more, I figured out that this tower, even though it's stationary and tangible, it's had, it has a really static lifetime. It's gone through a lot and seen a lot. And the man who donated the land, is uh, Walter Scott. He, when he donated the land in 1923 after just purchasing it for the Holyoke's 50th anniversary, he had no idea what the land was going to be used for. He had no idea that the tower was going to be named after him. He just figured it was connecting, um, it was connecting two parks that had already existed and it would be a nice, I mean, a nice contribution to the land that was already there. It was first used for, during the Great Depression, when the tower was built was begun in 1939 and was finished in 1940. And it was part of a Works Progress Administration project and it employed um, roughly 15 men providing jobs. But as soon as that was done, it was, it was given to the park. It was part of Anniversary Park. No one really had a name for it. It was just kind of like the tower at Anniversary Park. It was used, a lot of people enjoyed it and there was, now, there's, it's overgrown with trees, but back then, there was a hill that people used to go skiing and sledding down, and, and it was, people used to go picnicking up there, and it was really, really involved. But that was cut short by World War II. Um, the American Legion and the Army set up a tower, set up a post at the tower, they erected a hut at the base of the tower, and they had a working phone and electricity, and, and they had volunteers from the Women's Auxiliary and from um, the Knights of Columbus that would go up there 24-7, uh, all year long, whether it was sub-zero weather or not, and they would watch out for these air raiders that would come in because you can see Westover Air Base um, from the top of the tower. But after World War II was over, it was used for a park again, and then people were vandalizing it and spraying graffiti all over the place. And so in 1974, they started a restoration of the tower. And they got a man, uh, Joseph Merkel, who was the grandson of Paul Merkel, the original engineer for the project, to come in and sandblast the entire thing. So it had no more graffiti, and then it was cleaned up, and they added picnic tables and bridges and fireplaces, and they built a pool, and they put in the, um, the playground, and it was a lot of fun, and people started coming again. It was a great attraction, and it was, it was a, um, a high traffic area for the center of Holyoke. And after, when things started to lull a bit, around like the late 80s, it started being used for a place to party. Kids would go up there at night and, and just throw parties, and it was a meeting place for teenagers, and it's become a favorite pastime to climb up to the top of the tower and throw two by fours off and throw glass off. And, and, and see, how, see how far down the tower you can get graffiti, and it's, it's a, a bit dangerous, but it works. And um, 
at my at my friend's house that night, we later met up with some of his friends that he knew in the local area, and they were talking about this toga party that they were going to go to. They were so excited about this toga party at the top of Scott's Tower because there's no supervision and it's in the woods and no one really knows about it. And they invited us. I'm like, I'm not climbing up a hill in a sheet. That's I'd rather not. Like I'm I'm going to pass on that. But it's cool because the, there's this local group called the Friends of Scott's Tower that have become um, trying to clean up the area and restore this area and they treasure it as a not only an important historical piece but a, a, an important piece for the community and they first got together in 1995 and they had a blessing of the animals at that Easter and they had a rock concert it was where they would play music up at Scott's Tower but instead of having a band there they told everyone to bring a rock that they found in the area and they were going to rebuild a part of this that had fallen down and the work is far from over, but it's a good start, and they're still together now. And this is a postcard, and if you go to the Holyoke History Room at HCC, they have an ornament that you can buy. I forgot how much it was, but they have an ornament you can buy of Scott's Tower, which shows that someone has to know about this thing. I'm going to make an ornament of it. Yeah, so now I finally figured out the significance of this tower in the middle of the woods, and I won't sit on that rock to tie my shoes anymore. <laughs> oh, and I would like to credit most of my images to the local history room at HCC with help of Jim and the one with the women of sub zero weather with the air raiders. And um, what was the other one? I believe the man uh, sandblasting the tower. We're from the Wisteria Hearst Museum, and Penny emailed those to me. Um, are there any other questions or anything that was unclear or kind of weird? <laughs> All right, awesome. Hello. How's everybody doing? Good. Everyone awake? We got a lot more to go. All right. So I did my project on East Hampton industry in the 20th century. Um, this topic, uh, I've kind of been interested in a lot of these buildings that are around East Hampton. They are the old mills that used to be used by Stan Holm, uh, West Boylston. Um, my dad lives in New City. And every time I go there, I have a chance to drive by. And I've always wanted to learn more about them. So I took this chance, and here's my project. So the question I developed from my, the from, uh, my research was, what factors contributed to the success of Stanley Home Products and other East Hampton Industries, and how did those factors influence the changes in the operations of East Hampton Industry through the 20th century? Through more research, I developed a thesis, which is a changes occurred in East Hampton industry due to local and national events such as the world wars and strikes by industrial workers, social trends such as the pursuit of the American dream, new machinery, and a constantly shifting economy. The operations shifted to adapt to the changes in the, in, and the level of success in East Hampton industry was greatly influenced by these changes, more than often with improvement. Um, kind of a little bit of a background stuff. Um, labor unions during this time, uh, they weren't really successful until this time, the first few uh, decades in the 20th century. Um, the people who got jobs through labor unions only accounted for 3% of hired people. And the only time the labor unions were really successful were during the World Wars, because they had to replace um, the jobs of all the recruits. Um, the majority of workers were against organized labor, and there were over 23,000 strikes between 1881 and 1900. Um, leading industries in the 20th century were, uh, first off, West Boylston Mills. Um, they were the first textile industry in East Hampton. Uh, United, Elast United Elastic Corporation, which was formed by four major textile industries coming together to um, get a better profit. And Stanley Home Products, which I'm sure everyone has heard about, mm -hmm. um, they sold home supplies, and they were the most successful business other than textile in East Hampton. Does anyone know what the main type of product out of East Hampton Industries was? Okay, right here. Elastic webbing. I'm sorry? Elastic webbing. That's actually very, yes. The answer's right up there. That's good job. 
Someone knows their, their history. Um, all the major mills except for Stanholm manufactured elastic fabrics. Um, to achieve uh, ultimate success, the four companies that made um, United Elastic Corporation were Nashawanic Manufacturing Company, Glendale Elastic Fabric Company, George S. Colton Company, and the East Hampton Rubber Thread Company. Um, it ultimately, ultimately increased their profit and success. The most popular product was rayon. Does anyone know what rayon is? The back? Flammable fiber made from wood. I'm sorry? Fiber made from wood. Yes. Um, <laughs> someone else who knows their history. All right. Uh, it, was, it was more luxurious than silk, but it was also cheaper. So that really turned on consumers. Um, uh, there was a new chemical process that, were, that was developed to manufacture rayon. Um, it started as pulp or linter from wood or um, other plants and was made into the thread form um, through a chemical process. Manufacturing rayon was very expensive, so any, any company who took up manufacturing rayon was taking a bargain. It would either make them or break them. The biggest manufacturer of rayon was Hampton Company, which was previously known as West Boylston. West Boylston bought uh, the Wilson Mill and started Hampton Company. The leading industry's biggest threat was competition among each other. New methods of manufacturing and new machinery were constantly developed and adopted by these industries. Um, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> social, social trends, uh, consumerism and the supply and demand based economy during the 1950s and 60s um, caused a huge business boom. Um, this is when business like, businesses like Stanholm were most successful. Um, Stanholm's key to success was the hostess plan where they would pay um, women who worked from home to hold meetings at their house with all of their friends and relatives and they would inform people about uh, the product of the industry. Um, it was kind of like a pampered chef meeting or like a Tupperware meeting that we have today, but that's how uh, Stan Home was so successful during this time is they really got their word out. Another uh, social trend was the discontent of workers. Uh, another industry was uh, Paragon Rubber. There was a strike there and the workers wanted more vacation time and it took months until it was finally resolved. Uh, part of the mill was actually burned down by upset workers and um, they didn't, they didn't uh, settle the strike until a few months later. Religion, um, at Stanholm, it was a growing interest among the workers, religion, so they started uh, joining groups and they would sing together, they would pray together, and uh, they would uh, uh, Frank Stanley Beveridge finally decided it was something he would embrace and he started to lead them in sermons and, and praying and he developed the, uh, the Stanley Prayer which is right here and if everyone wouldn't mind we could all uh, recite this. <laughs> everyone ready? Yeah. Oh Lord, grant, me that, grant that each one that has to do with me today may be the happier one from it. Let it be given me each hour today what I shall say and grant me the wisdom of a loving heart that I may say the right thing rightly. Help me to enter into the mind of everyone who talks with me and keep me alive to the feelings of each one present. Give me a quick eye for little kindness that I may be ready in doing them and gracious in receiving them. Give me a quick perception of the feelings and needs of others, and make me eager-hearted in helping them. Amen. Thanks. And then, <laughs> Frank Stanley Beveridge was uh, born in Nova Scotia. He was kind of born a businessman. He, he started as a door-to-door -door salesman in his teens, and right off the bat, he was successful. He uh, became, he first worked for a brush company, and he became their leading salesman at 17, I believe it was. And uh, he moved from business to business, kept getting job offers, he eventually moved to America, to Pennsylvania, and became a, a business consultant. 
at another brush company. And then finally, he called uh, Catherine O'Brien, which was his secretary throughout the years at Stanley Home, and they started Stanley Home Products together. Uh, it started out as a little business on the top floor of a tobacco shed, and it became an $800 million industry, and he, it was just the ultimate, he was the ultimate successor, and everyone loved him. Uh, uh, he referred to his workers as associates. All of his workers were behind him and everything that he did. And that was a big part of his, his success, along with his uh, ultimate salesmanship. The conclusion, um, success in industry was directly influenced by events and social trends. Competition drove leading industries to stay on top, and changes in the community either led to the success or the downfall of a company. Um, I would like to thank uh, Ms. Feely from Forbes Library, being the local history goddess. Um, Ms. Per Mrs. Perrier from the East Hampton Historical Society. Uh, Ms. Kenny from Clio Associates. Ward Caswell from the Frank Stanley Beverage Foundation. And last but not least, Ms. Brown. All right, my name is Jake Ingraham. I'm a junior, soon to be senior here at East Hampton High School. Um, just talking about, as Joe said, World War II and the mainly the home front in Hampshire County. Uh, I was really interested in World War II and I actually knew a lot about it. Um, but I really wanted to learn what happened in this area because I've never really heard anything about that. So uh, we went to Forbes Library the first day to do research and the first thing I see when I walk in is a stack of nine volumes of scrapbooks that are sitting on a table for me filled with information and newspaper clippings that would have taken me about ten hours to go through. I got through the first two. This is my thesis statement. Um, it's kind of long, so I won't, I won't read it, I'll just tell you what it, you know, involves. Um, so really, what I was talking about was, uh, metal drives, um, war bonds, and neighborhood defenses, and those are really the three main topics that, uh, made up the home front in World War II. Um, I'll talk about each one of those in later slides, but, um, it's really, this is where I like uh, put my argument down as to what I would be talking about in my uh, paper. And this really helped me uh, go through and find um, articles from the nine volumes that I was going to be looking at. So, go to the next one. Oh, there we go. Alright, so first one is war bonds. And war bonds were started at the very outset of World War II, but they were actually called defense bonds because the war because uh, the U.S. was not in the war yet, so they couldn't call them war bonds. Um, they raised over 18 billion dollars, and they were the largest uh, amount of money that the U.S. got from World War II. Um, they were sold in increments starting at 25 dollars all the way up to 10 thousand dollars, and clubs in the Gazette and Northampton actually started to buy them on a weekly basis and this really shows the unified effort of uh, the talents to help support the war and all the people that went to it. Um, so this slide right here is, hold on a second, it actually shows it's a, um, it's a record for the two week period and it was banks sold uh, over 850 which uh, raised hundred over $168,000. And this was the first two weeks of the war when they were first called war bonds. So this doesn't include all the ones before the U.S. entered the war. So that number really just shows, you know, the commitment of this area to uh, raise money for the war. Our metal drives, and metal drives in this area were mainly focused around license plates. And just to tell you what metal drives are, they were... Um, started by the government to uh, help them accumulate scrap metal instead of waiting for you know steel to be produced and then they would have to buy all of that. So this was a lot cheaper, cheaper to uh, just ask communities to collect old scrap metal and then put them in a bin so they would be collected. 
Um, so like I said, the main thing that was collected in this area were license plates. And actually a record was set the first day, the second day actually, that a bin was set out in Northampton. A man put in 24 old license plates that he found in his garage. Um, they raised more metal than any other program that the U.S. had set up. And this one is talking about World War II. Um, I'm sorry. It's talking about uh, I want a uh, bin in Northampton that was set up. And this was actually two days after it was uh, put out and it was half full. So that just really showed the uh, amount of you know support the program had and how much people were actually, you know, looking through and like going along with the program. Um, so that just shows the, um, the support that this area gave for the war effort. And then, oh, hold on, lost it. So neighborhood defenses were really the main topic that I knew about. So this was one of the, my uh, longest topics. Um, so the U.S. started neighborhood defenses so that troops would not have to be pulled out of the army to come fight, to come uh, protect cities and towns. So instead what they did was they trained a group of people who were called air wardens and they would just go around and make sure that neighborhoods were protected and they could train other people to help them. And so air wardens set up uh, the uh, testing of air raid sirens and trial blackouts. Uh, actually the first air raid uh, test that Northampton had, almost none of the city could hear the sirens, which would not have been good if it was an actual air raid. Only, I believe it was the downtown of Northampton that could be, that, uh, could be heard. Everywhere else basically could not hear the sirens at all. Um, <clears throat> there was a trial blackout at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, which went off very smoothly. Uh, they got all the staff was ready and uh, they set up different beds for um, uh, patients that would need it if there was an actual air raid, if there was wounded people that needed to be treated. So that uh, the training that they got could really be seen there. Uh, spotting posts were actually set up to uh, help spot for uh, planes that were coming over the East Coast. And the town of Goshen was actually the first town around here to start employing women to uh, man their spotting posts during the day. And uh, one of the most interesting facts that I found about uh, what this article is about, uh, everybody knows the stone building on Daly Field, right? Well, that was actually used as a spotting post during World War II, which I had no idea. Everybody sees it and it's like, oh, you know, that must have just always been used for bathrooms or something like that. But it actually had a purpose at one point. And it became a spotting post when um, it was moved from, as uh, this one talks about, it was moved from the McGee House, which is on Hoyoke Street. And it was actually because uh, trucks coming off of Mount Tom sounded exactly like planes coming over the mountain, which really wasn't good because you'd have false alarms every single day, basically. Um, that and there was, uh, there, there weren't very good um, living conditions and living quarters for people to be stationed there. So they moved it to um, the, the daily field and put in heating and telephone and lights and beds and living quarters so people could stay there and uh, set the uh, spotting tower there. Um, so let's see. So yeah, that um, project was really interesting. And I actually learned a lot about World War II in this area. And it was just uh, very interesting to see all the support that uh, was given to World War II and all the support that you know, war bonds and metal drives had. And then neighborhood defenses, I had no idea that all of this was set up in this area. So that was very interesting to see this, the uh, history of East Hampton and Northampton and basically every town in Hampshire County. And so that's the end, and I just want to say thank you to Mrs. Feely for just giving me so much information that I didn't know what to do with it. So that was excellent, and the hardest part about that was trying to figure out which articles to use. And I want to thank Miss Cannon, I don't know if she's here, but she helped me, there you are Miss Cannon, she helped me find where the McGee House was on Hoyoke Street.
So that was a big help. And I just want to say thank you to Miss Brown as well for just being an excellent teacher and showing us all the fun parts of history this year. So, thank you. finished my junior year here at AHS, and for my final research project, I looked at how the Cold War spirit in the Pioneer River Valley compared to that abroad. Okay, now I need to get there. Okay. When we began this project, all I knew really was that I wanted to focus on the 50s, since it was just really the first decade where we started to see modern society and culture start to begin. But I really didn't know what aspect of it I wanted to look at. So I just, when we went to Forbes, went straight to the microfilm, more or less, and just dug through all the files related to the 50s. That took a long time. Eventually, I stumbled across some articles underneath the heading Civil Defense. I had no idea what that was. So after a little more digging, I figured out that it was a weird little facet of the 50s pertaining to the Cold War. Civil Defense was an agency created by the federal government tasked with controlling panic and educating the public about the atom bomb, the matter at the heart of the Cold War. The Cold War began at the end of, the, of World War II, and Germany out of the way, the attentions of America turned towards communist Russia, which had begun towards the end of the war, expanding its territories. When the Iron Curtain fell, the U.S. began to get decidedly worried. Initially, we had the upper hand, as we were the only nation in possession of the atom bomb. However, in 1949, the Soviets developed their own bomb, and by the 50s, the Cold War was well underway. The Cold War was a psychological war, with the U.S. projecting to Soviet Russia the threat of total destruction in the event of an attack. This worked because the atom bomb was so terrifying that if one country could be enough to threaten so that they would not attack, then the other country was likely not to come under attack as well. This policy, mutually assured destruction, deterred the USSR from striking. However, in order to project a credible threat, we had to have a huge stockpile of nuclear weapons, which greatly disturbed Americans who had been taught the danger of the bomb following Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Civil defense was instituted to re-educate the people, to make the bomb look safe, and to look, make a complete attack look survivable. This process, conventionalization, was intended to make the atom bomb look no more dangerous than traditional incendiaries. The agency that was created, the civil defense, was intended to re-educate Americans by teaching them that the bomb was safe and survivable, and also to give them instructions for their protection and their own survival after the attack, such as these here, which were medical instructions for the care of someone who had been struck by the bomb. Northampton had a very active civil defense, probably one of right up there with some others across the nation. The civil defense, headed by Colonel Leon J. Lavalle, routinely presented facts about the bomb and instructions to be carried out in the event of an air raid. The CD's information, of course, served not to really protect the people in the event of an air raid, but more so to keep them calm and in support of the bomb during times of peace. The ever-parodied duck and cover program, which that Lavalle referred to as going flat, was one of the many creations of the CD that was intended to give people hope that in the event of an attack, they could protect themselves right in their own homes. So the other ideas they came up with were a little bit less logical. For instance, radiation could supposedly be scrubbed off just with warm water and soap. <laughs> and if you were going to be attacked, you were best to wear light clothing that would not burn you, and in loose-fitting clothing so that should you fall down and you have a cushion of air around your body, <laughs> and it was very important that you were long sleeves, even in the hottest months, in case of an attack, so that your arms would not get burnt. <laughs> well, needless to say, most people took these instructions with a grain of salt. However, the paper definitely took them seriously. Most of the CD articles that were presented, especially in the earlier parts of the 50s, 
were right on the front page or in the first few pages of the newspaper. So the people of the valley did allow themselves to believe the civil defense to a certain extent. However, while they did practice air raid drills, which were instilled in every school in the valley, and they stocked their cellars in case they needed to use them as bomb shelters, their interest waned as the decade wore on and war failed to break out. Civil defense bulletins started being placed farther and farther back in the pit Canizia. Eventually, the war more or less petered out, and civil defense in Northampton, as well as across the nation, fell into obscurity. Are there any questions? None? Awesome. <laughs> I'd just like to give a quick thank you to Mrs. Feely and everyone else at Forbes Library for letting us use their microfilm when we came in a giant, terrifying horde. And to Mrs. Rowe for letting me make her do actual librarian work for once. And make her, I made her get books. I made her. And I'd also like to thank Mrs. Brown, because she's awesome, and I had a lot of fun with this project. I'm glad I got to take this class.
it, we are looking uncomfortably to the world we inherit. We proceeded to list the goals of the Students for a Democratic Society, including participatory democracy with equal opportunity and an economy with a higher purpose open to social democratic regulations. At Berkeley in 1964, a 32-hour sit-in was staged around a police car. Taking turns, students climbed on top of the cruiser and announced their grievances to the understanding crowd. They were actually pretty nice, but they remembered to take their shoes off before getting on the cruisers. It was kind of nice. No footprints for the officer. At Smith College, the president felt it unnecessary to involve students in policy making whereas the student body felt that they should at least be non they should at least be non voting members of the committees dealing with academic life to compromise the administration organized talk ins. Whereas at UMass, students demanded open housing, but administration was not ready to meet students' demands, so the decision was postponed. The new left evolved and came to encompass the issues of the war in Vietnam. College students were protesting the war from a speaker in Harvard Yard praising the Viet Cong, to students at Clark University in Worcester marching in support of U.S. involvement, to a demonstration held in front of the Army Post in Oakland, where students were stationed before heading to Vietnam. Johnson feared the protests would give America a false sense of weakness, and the Viet Cong, taking notice of the demonstrations, thanked the students for their efforts towards peace. At home, in protest of the Vietnam War, Students took their objections into the UF, UMass campus's student union building, where they confronted a recruiter and then staged a sit-in when asked to leave. This display followed a prior protest against Dow Chemical Company recruiters on campus, including a theatrical parade and chants. <coughs> Hippies and their like sought to radically reform society by breaking away, expanding their conscience, and converting people by blowing their minds. The hippies were defined by open sexuality, music with a message, and an escape from conformities of society through drugs. The yippies, members of the Youth International Party, tried to utilize this creativity for political means and social, social change, transforming demonstrations into street theater. The diggers wanted to break free of the money nexus that underwrote American society to form self-sustaining communities of life actors. They set up free stores and for about a year gave away free food. All these pe people embodied the values of camaraderie and drug use. Political sit-ins developed into beatings and lovings as communists attracted people trying to break away from conformity materialism. Ken Casey set out in the fall of 1965 on acid tests with his band of merry pranksters and a painted international harpster featuring the bumper sticker, Caution, Rear Load. I love that part. <laughs> Usually headlined by the Grateful Dead, these tests, which would later evolve into the Trips Festival, featured strobe lights, crazy costumes, painted bodies, and LSD, steadily supplied by East Coast native Osley Stanley III. Here in Western Mass, drug use was evident as early as 1964, when police reported that a small group of UMass students were involved in a marijuana ring. At Smith in 67, girls stated they knew of drug use by students, but it was all conducted off campus particularly at pop parties in Amherst and LSD trips at Wesleyan College. That same year, it was seen that drug use at UMass campus was minimal. However, two years later, a survey of UMass students determined that six of them used drugs. Franklin County came home to one of Northeast's largest and most dynamic communes when Michael Metalva of Leighton Mass returned from California and built a treehouse, living in solitude until his treehouse was destroyed in 1968. He and his band of friends and followers purchased 25 acres of Warwick Mass in 1970. Forming the Brotherhood of the Spirit, the Warwick era was a very self-sufficient time. 1973 to 76 was filled with a focus on Metallica's band, Spirit of Flesh, or Band of Flesh, I'm sorry, as the commune developed into a model community. The Brotherhood, of bringing the Renaissance community in 1974, purchased Chase Theater in Turner's Falls, opening many shops nearby while converting the theater into a recording studio. This is when Metallica began his drug addiction, changed his name to Rapunzel, and the band's name to Metallica, not to be confused with the heavy metal rock band. 1975 saw the purchase of the Old Stone Lodge in Gill, which would be the last addition to the Renaissance community. Membership, membership declined due to Rapunzel's erratic behavior, and in 1988, the remaining members offered him 
$100,000 to leave and never return, which he accepted. That year, the lodge was sold, marking the end of the Brotherhood. Musicians of the 60s played the soundtrack of the decade, receiving patronage from fans and immortalizing themselves in history as having affirmed the cultural unity by bringing all organizations together under the banner of a catchy and powerful tune. In his 1972 book, Guitar Army, John Sinclair said that the duty of the revolutionary is to make the revolution. The duty of the mus musician is to make music. But there is an equation that must not be missed. Music is revolution. Rock and roll music is one of the most vital revolutionary forces in the West. It blows people's minds all the way back to their senses and makes them feel good, like they're alive again in the middle of this monstrous funeral parlor we call Western civilization. Folk music became part popular medium to utilize when organizing civil rights or anti-war protests, thus establishing the legitimacy of singing in public. Events such as the Newport Folk Festival of 1963 and the Woodstock Music and Arts Festival of 1969 were important because they fostered the unity between the counterculture while pro providing a voice for the youth as they infused music with messages of discontent with society. Western Mass did have a voice, which was quite similar to those in New York or San Francisco, although slightly reserved. In 1996, the sexual revolution was evident on Smith College's music scene as Gang Green, an amateur rock and roll group, requested the president's permission to play naked. Staying away from messy beards, mod clothes, cigarettes dangling from lips, and arms covered with little red pinpricks, while still maintaining their signature uniqueness. Smith produced a band of their own, Maggie's Farm, just in time for the summer of love. Well-known artists also came to the area. 1969 featured Arlo Gerthy, son of Woody Gerthy, performing at Smith. His October show was matched on UMass campus homecoming weekend celebrations, including music of Laura Nairo, Tim Harden, and Sly and Family Stone. In conclusion, youth of the Western Massachusetts had a normally active role in the <coughs> culture that matched those of others their age nationwide. While the majority of these roles were not as earth shattering as the Hay Ashbury district or Green which villages folk scene, they were con contributions nonetheless to the overwhelming voice of a generation, disturbed by society, prepared to reform America, one mind-blowing experience at a time. I'd just like to take a minute to thank the Smith Special Archives and Forbes Library, including Mrs. Healy for directing me towards Smith, actually, and just for having such, a bound, such, such an abundance of resources. I mainly focused on newspaper articles from the Daily New York Gazette and Smith College's Define. So that's where I got most of my resources. I'd also like to thank my family for putting up with me while I wrote this whole paper and for bringing me to the library so many times. Thank you. And a really, really big thanks to Miss Brown for just being such an amazing teacher this year. I have had a blast. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica Connor, and my project is um, book banning and how it's the result of counterculture. I got into this project because I really didn't know what I wanted to do at first, and Ms. Feely suggested this topic, and I'm really into books, so I just decided to go with it. And, and my project is on the Northampton High School book banning of 1971. So my question that I got out of my research was, in what ways was, the book, was book banning in the 60s and 70s connected to the counterculture movement? To what extent is the man-child incident in Northampton an example of that? And my, uh, my thesis was, the book bannings of the 60s and 70s were a result of new opinions and resistance to them. Northampton High School banning only showed how accepting a community could be to counterculture and what some people will do to resist it. Claude Brown's book reflects the opinion of Brown and was taken off the shelves for how he chose to tell it. So what is book banning? Book banning is just another term for someone not liking another person's ideas. A book has to be challenged before it can be banned and most of the times challenges are turned down. Simple children's books like The Lorax by Dr. Seuss have been banned just because of the ideas they are written about. The Lorax is banned because
of it degraded the logging industry and gave America a bad name for starting global warning global warming books are usually banned in schools because school is a place to rid it's supposed to be a place where children can get away from external pressures and books written about that gave an opinion really put more pressure on students most people thought okay so the Northampton High School book banning was over Manchild in the Promised Land by Claude Brown. And in May 1971, Police Chief John Whalen went to the school and said that if this book was not removed from the school building and destroyed, that the, any members who had been taught the book would be fined and put in jail. Um, he stated that he had found 387 obscene words and phrases in the pages of Manchild and the general law of Massachusetts, chapter 27, section 28, the book was considered as an obscene material which was prohibited from being distributed to minors. The book was taught in English 107, which is a black history or black literature course for juniors and seniors. and. The book was be being used to teach students about the life of the life and experiences of Claude Brown. And Manchild in the Promised Land was written about Claude Brown was a autobiography by Claude Brown, and he wrote about his life growing up in Harlem, New York in the 30s and 40s and how he was part of gangs, ran in the streets, stole, conned his way and used drugs. And the school board or the police chief thought this was bad for students to be reading because it would cr they would roughen them up. So a review committee was formed of the two English teachers teaching the book, the librarian, the head of the media um, center, and the principal. And as they were reviewing this, the students were questioned, and none of them really objected to the book being in school. They actually preferred it to be in school because it taught them a lot more about life on the streets back in the 30s and 40s and what an African-American person was going through back in that time. And most of the statements the police chief had made were actually false. A lot of, he said that students had tried to get out of this course and had been ashamed to talk about this book, but really none of them were ashamed to talk about it and no one actually wanted to leave the course. On July 14, 1971, the book was approved by the school board or the review committee and was let back into the curriculum. And while this case was going on, over like a million copies were sold in the town of Northampton. Not a million, but a lot of copies of this book were sold in bookstores. And bookstores actually continuously kept this book in stock, except for a few who agreed with the police chief and discontinued selling the book. So how does this relate to cult counterculture? This, the fight to keep this book in the school showed that the younger generation was ready to accept in these new ideas that Claude Brown was trying to push in his book, that they were, they were ready to accept it, but there was still a resistance from the older generation, which was a perfect example of the generation gap that was created in the 60s between teenagers and the um, older generation, teenagers were ready to bring in individuality and new ideas and new opinions on life and everyone else was still conformist and saying, no, we don't want this anymore. So, yeah. Is there any questions? I would like to thank um, Sybil Smith and Diane Connor for interviewing with me and Mrs. Rowe for helping me get all of my books on book banning, Miss Brown and Miss Feely for putting up with me and all my questions, and thank you very much. We will now be taking a five minute break, and there, feel free to go to the bathroom and get up and walk around, and there are refreshments in the back, and when we come back, we'll be starting with the 19th century.